In 2004, I made two decisions that I didn't know was going to have a huge impact on my life. The first was I decided to go to grad school. Um, I had watched a 60 Minutes piece on veterans coming back from the Iraq and Afghanistan war. And they were talking about how we've made these great innovations in saving more people in the field that they were coming home with more disabilities, lost legs, lost limbs. And I decided that I wanted to go to grad school to help veterans come back and make prosthetic limbs. This is a whole story for another day, but I decided that in December, the applications for grad school were due in January. So I ended up at UMass, which is a great school, but I decided to go into their assistive technology lab and be more general. Um, the first two months, I was looking for something to do. I was looking for a project. Clearly, I couldn't make prosthetic limbs anymore because UMass doesn't do that. So an occupational therapist at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, a local hospital, um, was in acute mental health care. So she worked in a setting for people with mental illness where they would come in, and it's a locked mental health care facility. So it was the most extreme cases of mental health care that she would see. She was looking for a research partner to uh, work with. And I, I had the meeting with my advisor and her, and I'm thinking, well, this could be a project. There's really no engineers in mental health care. So in a few years, I might be in the field to be in and one of the few experts. Or worst case scenario, I'll have a master's or PhD, and I could always go teach or find a job with an advanced degree in mechanical engineering. So I didn't think there's any downside on that. But what I didn't know is about mental illness. So as she talked during that meeting, I got really surprised, actually. I didn't know anything about mental illness. I never heard of the word autism. I didn't know anything about um, anxiety-based disorders. I didn't know how big the problem was. I didn't know that one out of every four people actually hire have a diagnosable mental illness today at any given time in the Western world. I didn't know that depression is one of the world's, world's largest disease states. I think it's number one in high-income countries. So I was shocked. I was really surprised. And it became not just, oh, this would be a nice project. I, I should act on this. And what really got me was Tina was really in that room with us because she was trying to reduce the use of restraint and seclusion. So to give you a sense of that, that is nothing else works. Someone's still in a situation where they might be hurting themselves or others because of the mental state they're in. And they are tied to a bed and left in a room until they calm down and can be treated. That's the state of care oftentimes that's used in schools, hospitals, and homes, and nursing homes right now today. Now it's considered a treatment failure, and people are actively working to do this, and Tina's a leader in this. One of the things she was using is something called sensory-based intervention. So we might think aromatherapy is the one that might come to everyone's mind, and, and you might have tried it to help calm and regulate. Well, one of the other ones she was using was something called deep pressure. So giving weighted blankets, weighted vests to apply firm pressure to the body. Now, some of you might have heard of Temple Grandin's TED Talk that she gave. And it came out of the autism space of knowing this firm pressure can help people calm, regulate, and attend. So she was looking at how do we do more research in that field? And is there a way to improve and reduce the use of restraint and seclusion and have more humane technologies for people with mental illness and more assistive technology for people with mental illness? So I was interested. And I was shocked and appalled and said, something has to be done, and let's go at it. Now, her and I started in two paths. One, there was no research on this, almost literally no research besides Temple Grandin's paper. And so we had to do the research side. How much pressure, when, where, and why, and how long? She couldn't answer that question, even though she uses the product every day, that uses deep pressure every day. The other part of this was my job, right? Design something better. I'm the engineer. That's my thing. The thing is, there's no literature on designing products for people with mental illness. So the corollary I came to was people with cognitive disabilities. There's literature on that in the assistive technology space. And in that, they talked about universe of one. And isn't it, it's a great image, right? They're complex people, but they're very unique. It's almost like a u complex universe of one. In the autism literature, they talked a lot about, do you know one child with autism? You know one child with autism, right? They're very unique. You can't apply anything from one to the next. Further digging in the assistive technology literature is this problem with adoption that typically 35% or more of all AT devices are not adopted. So in my book, in academia, that's a D, right? Only 65% of the time, the product that was designed were, got adopted and used. So that's, that's not really a great thing to go off of. And for, even for life-saving technology, it's 8%. So this is something that could save your life, and still 8% of the time, people aren't using it and not getting adopted. Further digging came to this. The heterogeneity of autistic symptomology across cognitive, social, behavioral, and communication domains suggests a single user environment. Now, those symptoms are also very similar in acute mental health care settings, social communication behavioral disorders. 
but this renders typical design interaction techniques meaningless, making the need for assistive technology high, but the risk for adoption really low. So I was up a creek, not only without a boat or a pad without a boat or without a paddle. I had no research to, to, to inform me on how to design something, and the tools that I know as an engineer that I've been taught for years are useless. So what do you do, right? Well, it even gets worse. Because as engineers, we're, we design for, for uh, manufacturability. Design for manufacturability. We take whole classes on it. It's a whole section of mechanical engineering. But the intense focus on something that has to be customized leads to higher cost, which means lower adoption. OK? <laughs> so this leads me to a, a, an interesting story. Because after two years of doing this, I'm up a creek without a paddle. And I'm wandering the halls of, of Target because it's one of those days nothing was going right. And I went to Target to get something. I got to Target. I was in the aisles. I didn't even remember why I was there. So I was even more frustrated. And um, I walked past the men's section, the men's clothing section. I was looking at the t-shirts. And I've been tall and thin my whole life, and nothing fits me well. Okay, My sleeves are always like this, because if they were rolled out, they'd be too short. So I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm more frustrated. I'm sitting there thinking, a feeling of a jealous sibling came over me. Very much, I have an older brother and a younger sister, so I'm, I'm very familiar with this feeling. And um, I was sitting there going, well, my mom's always told me I'm unique. There's 300 million people in the, in the US that are unique, six, over 6 billion people. We all have unique fingerprints. We all have unique DNA. Especially in the Western world, we think we're unique individuals, right? So how can you be more unique? If I'm unique, you're unique, how can a child with autism be more unique than you or I, right? By definition, unique is unique. It got me thinking. But how can I go buy a t-shirt? Right? If you have 300 million people, how can you buy t-shirts? And I realized there's commonality across that. Right? It's market segmentation. You look at the, the, the group of people that all seem to be something similar, and then you can make a t-shirt. And enough people like red that there's red t-shirts, and enough people like green that are green t-shirts. So it got me to think about another definition. If I know someone has autism, by definition, the next person I see with autism, there must be something in common. There has to be, or else you can't define it as the same. And I realized if I know someone with autism, what I do know is about 85% or more have sensory processing disorders. Of the people with sensory processing disorders, I know that a group of them responds to deep pressure, Temple Grin and Story. It's widely and commonly used with people with autism. I also knew from the research I was doing, because I had to go do the research as an engineer, which I wasn't thrilled about, um, was that typical people also responded positively to the use of deep pressure. We did a study. We published on that. I also knew that from Tina's experience that the use of deep pressure in acute mental health care settings across a very heterogeneous, incredibly diverse population also benefited a large majority of people. So I realized that it wasn't about the universe of one anymore. My problem wasn't designing assistive technology for anyone. It was designing a deep pressure product that could help a group of people. So it now became a very different design problem. It was just apply, make pressure applied to the body in a portable, wearable, discrete way. Um, and this is what the lesson learned I took, and this is what I've internalized over the last nine years or so of doing this. I had to see the common and the different, and the different and the common. And this has driven everything I do, all the decisions, everything I do. I now have a company that took that research I did and is trying to commercialize it and bring it to the people who can benefit from it um, with evidence behind it. But this is every decision I do. Now, this is an abstract kind of statement. I still kind of play with it in my head, and what does it really mean? But I, I think of things in models and images. So to give you an idea, think of a pendulum with different on one side and common on the other side. For the people with autism and, and assistive technology, the conversation is always about the different. The pendulum got stuck to that side. It never swung and had it. It was always there. And it's really important that that conversation happen. I know nothing about autism and mental illness. It's like Alice going down the rabbit hole. Tina was the rabbit. I was Alice. And I went to a whole new world that I never knew, never understood. So I had to learn what was so different and learn the rules in the, in the language. It never swung to this other side of what was common. So for me now, I see this and what drives me is a pendulum that has to swing. It has to swing from different to common and back. And it can't get stuck. It has to keep on moving so that I always have a full idea of the picture. Now, how does that happen? What, how have I, have I figured out how to do that, or what's guided me in this process? I learned that 
it was so important to understand the difference because I knew nothing about mental illness. I had to hear from those parents and individuals that had the pain and had to explain to me how different their world and their day was on the most, what we think, trivial things. But it's huge issues and problems. I was lucky enough that I worked with professionals directly where they got to see a lot of people. So Tina realized deep pressure helped a lot of, across a lot of people. But she acutely also knew how different each one of her clients were. And she could talk about that. And then what I learned along the way after I had this epiphany was the individuals and parents also told you the common thing. I just wasn't aware to listen to it. They talked about how they wanted their kid to want to go to the mall with their kid and not have him have a meltdown. They talked about they wanting their kid to play Little League or to go to school and school events. All these common things that my brother and, with, and my nephew, he was talking about what he wanted for his nephew. They just want their child to be the best child they could be. So for me, I want to say we really need to have more people focus on mental illness. It is a huge, huge problem. We need to bring more innovation, more research, more design to it. We need to think about the common and the different and see that it's not just different and scary, but also there's commonality in that group with us, and we need to relate to that. For me, I also learned that to understand the common and the different, it wasn't talking to a lot of people. It was stopping and listening and learning from them and watching. Because I had nothing to add to that conversation. I knew nothing about their world or their day. But to see the different and the common, I had to be like Alice and go to a whole new world and put myself in a place that was different than my traditional engineering world. I mean, engineers aren't usually in mental health. That was the decision I made. And then ultimately, if this doesn't work, just wander the halls of Target and hopefully something will help you overcome your problem.